I'd invite you this morning, uh, if you have a Bible, to take it with me and turn to the book of Proverbs. We're in Proverbs, the eighth chapter today. I actually want to look at two texts this morning, Proverbs 8, and then I'm going to invite us to flip over to the book of Colossians to just a few verses out of chapter 1. But if you're with us this morning and able, I'd invite you to stand in honor of the Lord's word as we look at Proverbs 8, beginning at verse 22. The Lord created me at the beginning of his way before his deeds long in the past. I was formed in ancient times at the beginning, before the earth was. When there were no watery depths, I was brought forth when there were no springs flowing with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Before God made the earth and the fields or the first of the dry land, I was there when he established the heavens, when he marked out the horizon on the deep sea, when he thickened the clouds above, when he secured the fountains of the deep, when he set a limit for the sea so the waters couldn't go beyond his command, when he marked out the earth's foundations. I was beside him as a master of crafts. I was having fun, smiling before him all the time frolicking with the inhabited earth and delighting in the human race. Now, children, listen to me. Happy are those who keep to my ways. Listen to instruction and be wise. Don't avoid it. Happy are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorposts. Those who find me find life. They gain favor from the Lord. But those who offend me injure themselves. All those who hate me love death. And now Colossians, the first chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the one who is first over all creation. Because all things were created by him, both in the heavens and on the earth, the things that were visible, that are visible and the things that are invisible, whether they are thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He existed before all things and all things are held together in him. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the one who is firstborn from among the dead so that he might occupy the first place in everything because all the fullness of God was pleased to live in him. And he reconciled all things to himself through him, whether things on earth or in the heavens. And he brought peace through the blood of his cross. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So the last few weeks, both uh, kind of in sermons, but also in lectures across the street, There's been so much uh, in recent weeks about kind of news about the news that I've been picking on the news a lot. And in particular, I mentioned a couple weeks ago that when you watch the news, pay attention to the ways that it's constantly trying to kind of keep us stirred up and angry or maybe a little bit fearful. But I was was noticing that um, Deb and I have this kind of routine. We we tape a particular nightly news and uh, we usually either while we're eating or after we eat, we'll watch it. And, and I noticed that, that this particular news channel, every, every night, the last couple of minutes of the newscast, they have a segment they call Inspiring America. And this week, I mean, it was lovely. They have this segment this week, there were folks who were taking in Ukrainian refugees or there was a story about a bakery that employs people with special needs. But every night, it's, it's some wonderful tear-jerking story about people who've turned their own tragedy or their own challenges into beautiful ways to bless the lives of others. And I got tickled because I thought, it's as though the news producers are saying, we have 22 minutes. And for 20 of those minutes, we're going to scare the life out of you. And we're going to tell you all the awful things that are going on in the world. But in those last two minutes, before we go, we're going to remind you that there's still some beauty out there. And hold on to it. Rejoice in it and aspire to it. We uh, spent a couple weeks in the book of Job, um, rightly, wrestling with this powerful book that wants to wrestle with the problem of evil. And, 
And by the way, thanks, those of you who were with us last week. Um, I can't remember a sermon, at least in recent years, where I received as much email and notes as I received this week. Um, I, I know that when we wrestle with where is God in the broken stuff of life, there is something really meaningful and important and beautiful that we discover there. And so I'm, I'm glad that the message meant a lot to, to many of you, and, and it meant a lot to me. But now we turn to Proverbs, and we only get a week there, but Proverbs, in some ways, as part of the wisdom tradition, I would argue, wants to invert that question just a little bit. Job rightly wants to deal with the kind of problem of evil and wrestle with where is God in the midst of all of our suffering. Proverbs, in a sense, wants to deal with, I don't know if I should call it the problem today or just the reality of good. That before all of the difficult stuff, the bad stuff, causes you to wonder where God is and to walk away from faith, Proverbs wants to say, but wait a minute. As Proverbs 14.1 says, the fool says in their heart, there is no God. And before you walk away because of the problem of evil, let's, let's deal for a little while with the reality of good and how much wonderful, orderly, blessed, joyous things there are in the creation. It's as though after we've played all of our, some of you won't have these, but played all of our Rage Against the Machine uh, tracks. It's after we've played all of our heartbreak music and our struggling music and our sad stuff, it's as though we, something in us has to put on icy trees of green. Red roses too, I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, right? <laughs> What a wonderful world. What a wonderful world. My, my Louis the Armstrong sounds more like Cookie Monster, but uh, it's all good though. But there is something in Proverbs and rightly in us that says there is much brokenness to deal with, but there is also much good to see, observe, rejoice in, and pattern our life after. And so the text that we read this morning from Proverbs 8, and if you have a Bible, turn back there with me, Proverbs 8, 22. Old Testament scholars largely think if you want to look for a high point in the book of Proverbs, and there's a lot of wonderful things in Proverbs, there's a whole bunch of chapters where we get proverb after proverb after proverb. But a lot of scholars point to Proverbs 8, the text that we read as kind of the high point, both poetically but also theologically in the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs has a tendency to take this idea of wisdom and to take wisdom and then what we would call personify it. Think of wisdom not just as an entity, but think of it as a, a living thing, a living being. The Hebrew term for wisdom is chokmah, and you have to kind of spit when you say it, chokmah. In Greek, it's sophia. This, this personification of wisdom and and in Proverbs 8, it, the writers imagine that wisdom is this personified entity that when God created all things, and part of my love for Proverbs 8 is that it goes all the way back to the creation text, makes me want to talk about tohu bohu today, but it, it goes all the way back to creation when things were chaotic, but as God sets the world in order, gives the waters a limit, gives the dry land a specific place, as God creates living creatures, wisdom is there in the middle of it. And first of all, wisdom is delighting in it. It's my favorite part of the text, saying, oh, that was so great, delighting and celebrating and just thrilled with the order that God is creating. About the only thing I like about winters here in Idaho, other than the chance to ski on occasion, is I'm looking forward to the long days that are coming. But one kind of interesting thing with these short days is that, and now that I'm old, I get up early. Um, and, and oftentimes I'm the first one up in the house and I kind of enjoy that first ha half hour, hour before anybody else is up and it's kind of quiet. And we, we built this house that has just a lovely view of, of the lake, but also of the Oahe Mountains and a little bit of the golf course. And, and it sits up. And, and, and so in the winter, the only thing I kind of like is I get up and it's dark, right? 
And I have a chair that I sit in and read and pray, and that's kind of my spot. And I just love that almost probably five or six days out of seven, I get to see the sun rise during the winter. And our house faces south towards the Oahis, and I know if I sit there long enough in the dark, eventually the sky begins to turn a little brighter and a little brighter. And it didn't happen this morning because it was too cloudy this morning. I, about 7.25, the sky started to light up just a little bit. Sunrise was at 7.50 this morning. But on those really good cold days when there's no clouds in the sky, the sky starts to light up. The Oahis turn pink for a little while, and then they turn orange. And all of a sudden, off to my left, the, the sun begins to peek up over those mountains, and and the snow begins to glisten. Oh, it's just absolutely perfect, right? It's beautiful. And the, the writer of Proverbs imagines as though wisdom is like this child. You remember when your kids were little and you would put them on your shoulders and you would go running around and say, be an airplane, right? And they say, that was awesome, Dad. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. One of my favorite Old Testament writers says, Proverbs 8 imagines this personification of wisdom delighting in the human race, delighting in God's creation and saying, that's awesome, Dad. Do it again. Do it again. And so I know this sounds weird, but every morning when I watch the sunrise, I have this odd thought. Every once in a while I'll think, I wonder if it won't come up. What if today's the day it doesn't come up, right? What if this is the day the earth stops rotating and we just live in darkness? But in ways that are not only beautiful and daily, but in ways that are predictable so that we would know that the sun rose exactly at 7.50 this morning and it rises a little later or earlier tomorrow and it's going to go earlier and earlier and we're going to have long days. In ways that are ordered and expected but at the same time delightful and beautiful, things are going to start blooming soon. And there is a joy and a delight and a goodness and a beauty and an awesomeness to the order that God has placed in the world. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. What a wonderful world. But not only does this personification of wisdom delight in, in what God is doing, this personification weaves itself into every aspect of creation. So it's there at the beginning, not just delighting, but, but in the Hebrew imagination, chokmah is it's like this thread that finds itself woven into every aspect of creation. And so there is orderliness, there is beauty, there is wisdom into all things. And this is why Proverbs, as you read them, Proverbs have to do with every aspect of our life, our, our physical life, our relationships, our home life, our economy. It has to do with how we eat, it has to do with how we rest, it has to do with how we treat our neighbors, it has to do with how we structure society. I mean, there's Proverbs in a sense for almost everything. And the reason for that is because the Hebrews believe chokmah, wisdom, is woven through every aspect of the world. It's, it's partly why I love the chance to get to hang, across, hang around across the street. Because there's something really fun, especially about like Christian higher education, where the stuff that we get to do in the God building is really cool because we know all things. Um, but <laughs> there's something so cool about all of you nerds who hang out in the science building and who every day go to devote yourself to finding the, the chokmah, the, the wisdom of God woven in chemistry and biology and physics and all those cool animals that you have around. The part of the work that's going on there is a realization there is something in the fabric of the universe with, worth knowing and discovering. And you folks in the social sciences, the mystery of humanness and the complexity of our minds and emotions, the complexity of our relationships, those of you in sociology and social work, the complexity of our human communities, but the, the orderliness, the the thing that is woven through all of these different communities and the business building, the complexities of economic systems, but the order that's woven into this household, this economy that we are a part of. All of you in the arts that get to celebrate poetry and literature and music that all has, as we'll come back to in a moment, its own kind of orderliness. 
It's a, it's a reminder that the chokmah, the wisdom of God, is woven through every aspect of life. And it's delightful, and it is there. But, wis, but the wisdom tradition in Proverbs also imagines and personifies this wisdom in a way that it invites us. And so there's a, a constant theme through Proverbs. And uh, forgive me, it's in the ancient world, this, this text is largely addressed to young men. And so the personification of wisdom and the other tends to be imagined as women who are in a sense calling to these young men and inviting them to come to life. And so, for example, in, in chapter 8, at the beginning, if we'd have gone all the way back, Hokma, wisdom, lady wisdom, stands at the gates of the city and invites everybody to come, learn from her, delight in her, live with her, know about her. But if you go back to chapter 7, there's this other lady, we'll call her Lady Folly or something along those lines. And Lady Folly usually sounds like this, ha, ha, Fifi, come along with me. And calls out and says, do not listen to her, listen to, I don't know why she has a French accent, but she comes and she says, oh, come and live with me. Now I know it's strange to think of kind of wisdoms personified as these women who call out to these young men. But part of what that says to us, and I think this is very important, is wisdom is not just something we have in our heads. In fact, the more we've been studying Proverbs, the more I realize Proverbs is really aimed not so much as our, at our brain, but right here at our heart. Wisdom is not just something we come to know. Wisdom is something we come to love, to desire, to want, to live with, to dwell within. But the problem is there are all these counter voices that say, come learn from me, love me instead. Live with me. Let me shape not just your thoughts, but let me shape your desires, your wants, your imagination. And so Proverbs imagines this chokmah, this thread that is delightful and good and woven through all things that invites us to come and to desire and to love it. I, I want to share an illustration. And so let me come back over here. So this illustration would be much better if I hadn't quit piano in about the ninth grade, but. <laughs> but one of the strange things about music is this. So this is middle C. And I know just enough music theory to be dangerous, but, but the odd thing about middle C, when, when that string is hit by that hammer in the piano, we know that what we're hearing is not actually just middle C. We actually are hearing this. That when that string vibrates, those notes are also there. And that's why when we play a C chord like that, it sounds right, right? It sounds like there is a harmony to it. Now, here's the thing. I don't understand why it works that way. In fact, I'm not sure anybody really understands why it works that way. It's just woven into the pattern of creation that that's what happens. And because of that, then that sounds right. Where this does not sound right. <laughs> sounds like disharmony. Are, are you with me? Part of the reason I, I quit piano was because I would have all these teachers who would say, come, learn from me and learn this. Come on, right? Like there's some basics that you have to learn about, about how this works. And once you learn how it works, you can kind of go from key to key. See, that's awful. I, can, I remember the the introduction to friends are friends forever. <laughs> Man, it really worked when I was in teen talent. Um, <laughs> but, 
But here's the amazing thing about music. If you won't quit in junior high, and if you will allow yourself to learn how it all works, somehow in committing oneself to that, in, in learning to love that, learning to know that, in, and this is where I never got to, in learning to inhabit that, once you do that, you can do all kinds of amazing things with that, right? You, you can turn it into unbelievable music. You can play around with some of those harmonies in ways that still make them sound okay. Even, but it's because you know the heart of what makes it music in the first place. Are, are you with me? If you could go to Colossians for just a moment. The writer of Colossians, likely Paul, is writing to a church that has voices also calling to it. It's mostly empire voices. Some of this hymn that we just read in Colossians is, has a lot of language that's similar to the ways that Caesar would talk about himself as the Lord of all things, holding all things together, the one who brings peace. And so at some level, the, the hymn's quite subversive. It's saying, don't listen to that voice. Listen to this voice that says, all things are not held together in the empire. All things are held together in Christ. It is not the threat of violence that the empire brings that brings peace. It is it is the love, death, and reconciliation of Christ that brings ultimate peace. So it's quite subversive. But the hymn actually does a profound thing. Part of the reason I wanted to read it is because so much of the language is, is borrowed from Proverbs 8. Not to get too nerdy, but, but one of the interesting things, I know they come after the Gospels in the order of the New Testament, but it's likely that a letter like Colossians was written well before any of the four Gospels were finished. And so scholars find something like the hymn of, of chapter one so fascinating because it's, a, it's an insight into the way the early church, prior to the writing of the Gospels, understood who Jesus was. And the way they are already connecting this idea, this personification of wisdom, only it's being altered a bit. And now in their worship and in their imagination, what we now think of as the second person of the Trinity exists there at creation, delighting, and then profoundly all of this beauty, all of this goodness, all this hokma woven into the world, now for the early church has a face and a name, Jesus Christ, the risen one. Amen. And now to know and to love wisdom is to now is to know and to love Christ. And here's the part that I really love in the language of the hymn, the theology of the Colossians. Not only is Christ the embodiment of this wisdom from the past and from creation, but the hymn says he is also the first born from the dead. He is, if you will, the one who embodies the music of the past and creation, but also the one who embodies the melodies of the future and what is to come. So Paul can say, in him, all things come together. Things that have been and things that will be all come together in Christ. And so to, to know the joy that God intends for us, to know the pattern that God has for his people, to know and to love the things of God is now to know and to love Christ and him alone, for in him all things hold together. I think this message is actually really still pretty radical in our day. To me, the, the challenge of this kind of message is this, that if I could go back to the piano for just a minute, I think we live in a world that says, this is very boring. Why would you want to learn the fabric of music? Why don't you just do this? How 
How creative is that? I, I fear that we have, and I wish I had a whiteboard in three hours and we could talk about how we got here philosophically. But I think we live in a time that says, especially to the young, this is not only boring, but it's oppressive. And what I would say to all of us this morning is, that may be free, but eventually, like a little child who bangs on the keyboard for the first time, eventually your neighbors are gonna say, could you knock that off over there? For there's nothing actually really beautiful or good or that fits with the harmonies intended to be called music in that. And, and so the problem with the text like this is it always, it always sounds in some ways like God is saying to us, if you wanna play well, you have to start by, by submitting yourself to the chokmah to the wisdom, to Christ. And, and you not only have to give yourself to that, but you have to learn to love that, shape one's life according to that. And that sounds so antithetical to our modern ways of complete liberality and freedom. But here's what I absolutely believe. As Jesus said, if you want to find yourself, if you want to sit down and just start hammering out on any old keys, you will make noise but not music. And you will lose yourself. But if, as wisdom says, if you will come and know me and love me and learn from me, as Christ says, if you will come and let me dwell in you and you in me, if you will come and lose your life for my sake and for the sake of the kingdom, you will find it. And out of the life of love and service and goodness, you won't be free from struggle. But joy will be present and music will be there. And the more you learn that life and the more you dwell in that life, the more I can do something unbelievable through you. We're gonna close with this song. Um, I love this kind of contemporary chorus, worthy of all the songs we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. We live for you. Chorus says, I will build my life upon your love. This morning, um, as we sing it, many of you, hopefully most of you, know that life. That's why you got up this morning, made your way to church on a March morning that's still too cold for spring. but you have responded to God's voice and you want to know more, love more, be rooted in the things of God that lead to the beautiful music that God wants to write through you. But there may be somebody here today, maybe somebody online, maybe somebody here this morning for whom um, it feels like you've sat down at the keyboard of life and just randomly started banging on keys. And not only is the music not really delightful to anybody else, it's really getting old for you too. And the only answer is to lean in and to love Christ and to desire to know him and be known by him 
and for his ways to become your ways. And what sounds like giving up oneself actually turns out to be the key to real freedom, to being able to sit down and play anything, for life to resonate with all the beauty that God intends. And so if you're here this morning, you, you can certainly open your life where you are. We have these spaces that we've created in this tradition. We used to call them mourner's benches. I think we used to sit on them when we called them that. They were places where we just kind of knew the brokenness was more than we wanted to keep anymore. And so we would give that away. Eventually we started to call them altars places where something inside us knew God has come close to us. And the only way we know how to respond is to come close to God. And this morning, there may be some of you who want to draw near to the God who has come close to you and offer your life. And say, God, I'm, I'm really tired of trying to write my own tune and I don't even know where middle C is. Would you come she began to teach me your ways. This is a space for you this morning as we sing. Would you stand with me? Let's sing it together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
God, we thank you today uh, that you have not left us to find our own way. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Your presence, your spirit, your wisdom is woven in the fabric of the universe, in the grain of creation. And that word, that wisdom, has become flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And we have beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So teach us to love your ways. Teach us to love your purposes. Teach us to love and to follow your son. And in him, the one who holds all things together. May we find the renewal of joy. May we find the way of true peace. And may we find the ways that allow you to make beautiful music of our lives. So we offer them to you today. Make us your people. For we pray in Christ's name. And everybody said, Amen, amen. Well, um, as we go this morning, just a couple of last things. First of all, Pastor Diane, thank you. We love you. Thanks for loving us and thanks for whipping me into shape occasionally theologically and for the ways that you have cared for the staff and for this church. And we're glad you're not going anywhere because we just drag you right back. I would invite you to come tonight uh, to celebrate what God is doing, but also to pray with us and look forward to what God has for us in, the, in this year to come. And so we'd love for you to come tonight. If you listen well, um, there's a wisdom that God has for us, a way that God has for us. And, <laughs> and here's what Proverbs basically says, it's gonna mess with every aspect of your life. And when we allow Christ, when we allow the wisdom of God, the life of God to take over every aspect of our life, we just call that the sanctified life. That's why this benediction is for us. And now may the God who truly is making true peace, may he sanctify us through and through. May our whole spirit, our souls, our bodies, may they be kept sound and blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who called us and keeps calling us, he is faithful. And he will not stop inviting us into his ways until he has finished all things through us. God's people said, amen. Go in his peace.